Um, or else to Phoenix. Let me tell you a little bit about, uh, well, let's go through the agenda here real quick. Um, what I'm going to talk about primarily is why I even considered converting an application from Rails to Phoenix. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the approach. I'm not going to talk you, but tell you how to do it uh, because everybody's application is different. I'm going to tell you the approach that I took and where I stand right now in the process, which is um, quite far considering this is my first attempt at, at this kind of thing. I'm going to give you a little bit about the, the learnings that I've had and talk to you a little bit about the, the next steps. Um, so you're probably wondering, who is this guy? <clears throat> well, I, uh, at, as Ben said, I've been doing Ruby and Rails probably for about six years. Uh, on and off early on. Uh, I have a separate business that I own with a co-founder and that business has developed an application that we call AOT and that application is the one I'm going to be talking about tonight. So it's my application that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, one of the other things I'll tell you is that I am the only developer so um, some of the things that I'm going to talk about really are dear to my heart because they're in the context of you basically having to take the entire application, functionality, technical aspects, database, everything on your own. And it's an application that, that I've had um, that's been under development since 2005. So it's a relatively old application. And, uh, and we're in the process of sprucing it up. I've been in the business, as Ben said, um, for a bit of time. I'm probably the oldest one in the room here looking around. Um, my understanding is that, that uh, at, at Google, uh, the average is less than 30 years old. At, uh, I guess, Stack Overflow, I think, had some statistics where they said the average person on Stack Overflow is 27 years old. And uh, so that makes me about 2.1 developers. <laughs> um, that's, that includes volume and mass and everything, as well as age. <laughs> Um, the, the, let's talk about the app for a second. The app is one that uh, um, came about as a result of myself and my co-founder being in the business consulting environment for a long time. Um, probably about 25 years of consulting experience between the two of us, but the other thing that's kind of unique about it is that we're also product people. We we believe there's more than just you know what's up here. We want to put it, we wanted to put what we had uh, in, as far as a process for business consulting and especially around what we call alignment optimization into into a tool that we could offer the world. And the world for us is primarily uh, consulting firms that have domain expertise. They know something about a particular industry or a particular field, but they may not have the wherewithal to have their own development team. They may have a process that they that maybe is a little loose and they don't necessarily um, follow a rigorous process to, to help uh, serve their clients. And so what we brought to the table was a platform that other clients uh, consultants can use to deliver uh, to their their constituents. Roughly, we have about two dozen active consulting agencies that work with our platform on a regular basis, and they service about a hundred thousand people a year uh, through this platform. Not a lot. I mean, in web terms, that's not a lot. Uh, but the process itself basically allows them to take the, uh, their knowledge coupled with our application and help businesses, groups, uh, strategy efforts, projects, things like that, align around their goals, their objectives, their 
uh, talk about their barriers, talk about the assumptions that they're making, and come together in, in a very rapid fashion. Um, what we estimate is that there's somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour invested by each one of the people who are actually part of the experience. You, cup, you can pair that to my experience in business. I don't know what yours is, but meetings take a lot of time. And they don't tend to be very productive. They also don't tend to be very measurable. So our product is all about metrics. How aligned are you? We have alignment measurements that we make. We, we have sentiment analysis that we add into the product. And we then turn around and, and offer that back to each and every person who's participating so that they can see how they sit with their thoughts and their thinking, their opinions around whatever the topic is. Uh, and it, it has been a, a, a great success uh, considering that there's really only two of us doing it. <laughs> so um, the last thing I'm going to mention is I don't hate Ruby. All right, so let's just get that out of the, out of the way right up front. Um, I use Ruby. I use Rails every day. Um, I love the, what it's, you know, it does make me smile. I enjoy working with it. My attempt here was to address some challenges that I found with Rails and Ruby, and, and we're going to go through those. The, the uh, application, uh, which I, I talked about earlier, is called Alignment Optimization Technology, AOT. Everything's got a TLA, right? That is the name of the technology that we developed from 2005 on. Uh, it's on its second iteration. Um, the infrastructure diagram that I put in here, I threw in so that it would be a little bit helpful for you to understand uh, pretty much where we are right now. The application started out as a PHP application. Don't boo me for that, OK? Um, it, it was my first attempt at PHP, and it turned out to be very successful because uh, I was able to get something up and running very rapidly in 2005. Remind, me, remind you that it's 2005 at this point. I was able to get something up and running, and um, I was able to serve the needs of our clients. Rapidly got to the point where it grew, as most PHP applications do, to the point where I couldn't maintain it. It was a lot of code, an awful lot of code, and an awful lot of SQL, and an awful lot of complexity along the way. Uh, about five or six years ago, I decided to look at converting it to Ruby on Rails. And what I did was I started with the, what we call the back end. There's an awful lot of our product that can't be done real time. It's just PHP is too slow. The analysis sometimes can take an hour for, for us to analyze 20,000 people's different results on 100 different points of, of, of interest. It took a long time for us to process that. So I split it very quickly into a, a back end process and a a front-end process, the front-end process supported by PHP. Um, during, during that activity, I chose Beanstalk as a mechanism for uh, controlling the various back-end processes. Originally, there were a number of PHP processes. I had some Python in there. I still do have some Python in there because we have a grammar analysis product that's um, the natural language toolkit that's built on top of Python. Some of you may be familiar with that. So basically, I needed to have a multilingual environment that could take commands, process information, and get it back into the database. When I switched over to Ruby on Rails, basically, I moved all of the back-end processing except for the, the um, active grammar review. That's what the AGR box is down the lower left-hand corner. I moved all of that to Ruby and Rails. And that was a spectacular improvement. Uh, spectacular in terms of, of the measure that's important to me, and that is that I could manage it. It was also very, very robust. 
uh, I, I, all of the processes, and there are about 22 of them that run in the background engine for in Ruby and, and on Rails, basically could handle the whole application without any kind of uh, taking away from the front end. So I'm left with this PHP application, which is the UI. I am not a UI person. But I have to have a UI that's very, very responsive. And so when I uh, started down the path of trying to convert the Rails uh, to a Rails UI, I immediately ran into many of the things that, that I think most Rails applications of any size run into. And that is that there's, there's an awful lot of interactivity that you've got to build on top of Rails. And there's a, there's a lot of performance challenges here and there in Rails. And I'm gonna, I made some bad decisions. And we're going to talk about some of those bad decisions today. Uh, but um, in March of this year, I decided maybe I ought to take a look before I go all the way down the Ruby Rails path and see whether this thing called Phoenix, Ecto, Elixir, all of those things. I, I'm going to assume that some of you or most of you know what these terms are and what, and what the places are that they hold in the equivalency to Ruby and Rails. And if you don't, just raise your hand and I'll try to ex explain it. But the, I wanted to take a test run and see whether I could address some of the things that I'd run into uh, with the Rails uh, environment. So I, I kind of categorized those for the purpose of this presentation into five uh, different categories, and that is functionality, robustness, the maintainability and testability, and then of course the, the real challenging element and that is performance. From a functionality viewpoint, that, that is always first and foremost, that's the experience that, that people want to have in the application. And uh, as, as everyone in this room knows, the bar is pretty high and it's getting higher all of the time in terms of interactivity in terms of uh, the expectations of the examples that people have, not only on their browser, but on their phone, in, their, in apps and things like that, it just continues to get harder and harder for you to meet the expectation of the, of, of the average user. And, that's, and, and it's, it's not going to get any easier for, for our, our industry. Frameworks supply the code. I mean, most of the code that you're going to write from now until you retire, which I hope to do pretty soon, um, it is going to be code that's built on some sort of a fr uh, set of frameworks. And the, that framework, is, the framework you choose is going to be key to your success. You're going to have to invest in learning that framework. You're going to have to invest in upgrading as you go through various versions of that framework, and hopefully that framework has the legs and the capabilities that, that you're going to need in order to satisfy um, the needs of your application. Like I said, interactivity is the norm. And the Rails way, as far as I can tell, is there's Rails, and then there's you add something to it, uh, whether that's React, whether that's uh, some, other, uh, some other favorite framework or, or whatever, there's usually some other component that's, that is involved with the Rails application. So, uh, so you, don't need, you don't just learn one component, one framework that does it all. And that's true as well, in, of, of course, in the Phoenix, Ecto, Elixir environment as well. Uh, robustness. You've got to have an application, or at least I do, since I'm this old developer. I'm, I've got to have an application that handles failure very gracefully. It's got to, it's got to perform, and when it doesn't perform, I've got to know about it right away. I've got to be the guy who is telling them I'm, I'm on top of it, I'm going to fix it, and I can't, I can't be like digging through logs and, and, and taking my time doing that. Um, Retrying should be an option. 
um, you, you should have you should have the capability to have the application itself know when it's okay for it to uh, to retry an operation, and and that should be as automatic as possible. You don't want to have to build monitors that monitor the monitor that monitor the monitor, um, and and I've had to do that in in my relatively simple application uh, in order to ensure that everything's working all of the time and that I know when it's not. Um, and then concurrency. Um, that's a big one for me. I shouldn't have to worry about it. I, I'd love to not be involved in writing code, threads, whatever you're going to use as your favorite tool for maintaining concurrency. I shouldn't have to worry about concurrency. It should be built in, um, that, and that's the ideal. Let's talk for a second about testability. This is a big one for me because I spend most of my life testing software to prove that it's doing what it's doing, especially as I in, engage with Hint and help them with upgrading applications for their clients. Um, testing is 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 probably 80% of what I do. Um, I'd love to be able to test results all of the time and not the process that it took to get there. I think we all would, would like to be able to do that, but um, the more complex the application, the more tendency there is to have to test the process. What I do not like and what I find challenging with a language that's as flexible as a language like Ruby is that I have to test language features. I have to test the code because unless the code is executed in Ruby, I can't tell that that line of code's going to work when it hits production. So I need to have very, very high line of code coverage, and that includes handling all of the conditional behavior and, and so forth as we use one line, uh, single line conditionals and go around code and it looks like we executed it and it counted on the line of code coverage but it really didn't get executed at all. I need to view the coverage through the functional lens, not as line of code. I need to be able to say what functions did I in, in want to have in my application? Ec um, what functions do I have proper tests for on a, on a functional level and not just measure, okay, I got 95, 98% line of co code coverage because that doesn't help me. That doesn't help me prove that my application uh, is operating. But I do spend a lot of time trying to achieve that line of code coverage because I'm testing for the syntax. I'm testing that that syntax is proper, that it's running, that I haven't got a typo in there. Um, in Elixir, the code is really the fuel for that static analysis that I have wanted for so long in, in Ruby and that I think is, is very much lacking. And when I talk about Ruby lacking it, that means that Rails is lacking it too. I, I do not have a good appreciation and I should, as a developer, how much of that framework is actually tested and how well it's tested. And so I have to trust that framework. Fourth item, maintainability. I have struggled to maintain this application um, almost since day one. Um, there, there's always more functionality that I'd like to put in it. I, am, I have to wear a number of different hats. Um, and I would love to have a team uh, to be able to work with me uh, to, to help to develop that application further, but uh, the larger an application gets, the more you have to have multiple people. The more you have to have multiple people, the more you have to um, subdivide the responsibilities. And you don't get very far with that because everybody only knows still a small part of the application. You need to be able to isolate functionality. You need to be able to do that so that you can section it off and replace it with better functionality later on. 
um, microservices. I'd love to be able to say those those are the the way of the future. I I think that there's some debate about that, and I'm okay with the debate about microservices, but certainly they're easier to understand because they're more compartmentalized. Um, this the third one is a big one for me. Ensure that new code will technically just work. As I said, we were talking about testability. Unless a line of code is executed, I don't even know whether syntactically that line of code is correct. I, I just don't know. And uh, I love Ruby. I love the ease that I have in writing Ruby. But I write just as much, it seems, in test suites as I do in writing the code itself. And those test suites do tend to be unit test where I'm just trying to exercise lines of code and not functionality. I, I want to be able to spend my time on functional additions that the clients are clamoring for. I think, I think we all do that, would, would want to do that because then we see the smiles on their faces. Rails has evolved considerably. Um, my application, when I started the Rails side of the application, I started right at the tail end of Rails 3. Um, I looked at Rails 3 and then I, uh, and I knew Rails 4 was on the horizon and I paused and waited for Rails 4 to, to come out. And so I never had the pleasure of going through Rails 3 uh, with this particular application. I've had the pleasure many times since of converting Rails 3 applications to Rails 4 and on. Um, but as it's gotten more features, it's gotten more complex. And from my perspective, the quality has not stayed the same. It's actually deteriorated. It's not a good thing for the framework uh, to have that, that happen. And like I said, I love Rails. I love Ruby. Uh, but I got to be honest that it, it was a real challenge for me to, uh, to continue to upgrade my application. By the way, the application that we're talking about here is right now on 5.2.3. So it's, it's been upgraded. It's gone through the pain. It's gone through the benefits that, um, that we've gotten in new versions of Rails. So it isn't one of those applications that's, I'll say, stagnated. Performance. Performance is the last thing that I want to worry about. It is the first thing, it seems, that most users want to worry about. And that's in, in direct conflict. If I've got something that doesn't perform, I'm taking away time from writing new functionality and so forth and spending my time trying to eke out the, the last few seconds of response that I can get. And it, it is, for me, a constant challenge. Um, there are, in Rails, multiple performance techniques that you can use, like caching and, and memoization. And there's lots of choices. Uh, so even making the choice of how you try to enhance your, the performance of your application is itself an effort that takes time and lots of evaluation. I went through that with my PHP application. It is heavily cached. Um, and I'm throwing that application aside by moving it to uh, Rails. And my first experiences with the Rails side are that it performs much slower than my PHP application, as probably most of you who've done both uh, would, would uh, agree with. The, all, taking a functioning app and addressing the performance should be a very rare event. That's my opinion. Uh, I don't have data to back that up, but in my opinion, if, it's, if it functions, having to change it purely to enhance performance and so forth uh, should be something that you, you do very, very rarely. So uh, to summarize, the, the app should be the focus of the development, not the tool. I shouldn't be spending my time learning all about the nuances of Rails. I should be cranking out code uh, that serves my client. 
the more reliable that the tool is, the, the less focus um, that it attracts. That means that I'm not drawn into, you know, searching on Google for the latest thing that I need to, to know in order to fix this problem. If it's just works and so forth, then it becomes something that's transparent in the process. Um, guidance from the application, the app or the framework telling me how to do what it is that I'm supposed to do properly is much appreciated. Um, and, and I have the TLA EDD here. Uh, what I mean by that is error driven development. And uh, that's a, a coin that, that I know Nate appreciates. Um, but when I got into Elixir and I started trying to work through Phoenix and so forth, the error messages that you get from that process as you're going through and trying to achieve the, something comparable to what you already have in Rails or what you want to achieve, the error messages are just phenomenally good. And you can go through the application and just let it lead you through to a functioning application. It's just, to me, it's extraordinary and something we could all learn from uh, in, in any framework that we use. So less can be more. Let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the choice that I made with um, exploring Phoenix, exploring Ecto, and, and Elixir. Just so you understand, Phoenix and Ecto play, Phoenix is sort of like a lightweight web request processing framework. Ecto, for those of you know, who might not know, is sort of like the equivalent to, uh, I hate to call it this, but the equivalent to active record. Uh, portion of Rails. I mean, it, it handles some of the model aspects of active model, and it handles the querying of whatever your persistent uh, backup store is. And then Elixir is, of course, the language. Um, the, what I found was that there's basically a real solid MVC model there with Live View for, that helps with the interactivity. It, it uh, basically allowed me to provide some kinds of push capabilities where I didn't have those before, where I had the, the standard refresh the page approach um, that, that makes it look very much like a client application to the people who are using it. I mean, they, they experience it as being responsive. They experience it as being, oh, look, it's changing without me touching anything. Um, you know, the kind of things that, that are not that easy to do with, with some other frameworks um, that are equally powerful. It has a Rails-like structure to its directory structure, not surprising given that it kind of was born out of taking some of the Rails philosophies and so forth. Um, and it has, and, and we'll go through these in a second, it has a set of of Rails equivalent modules that are plugins that serve the same sorts of things that we commonly expect in some of the more uh, traditional gems and things like that in Rails. It's got compiled level performance, and that is extraordinary, uh, especially given it has the compiled level performance in the templates themselves. Um, one of the things that I had a lot, lot of difficulty was my choice, um, personal choice, was that I used Haml for, instead of ERBs for my application. I like the structure, I like the cleanness of it, and uh, that is probably one of the slowest con conversions that that happens in the, in anywhere in the pipeline uh, in Rails. So. That was my choice, and I understand that I could have, you know, speeded that up quite a bit, but I just want to throw that out there. We all make bad choices. Um, it has composable queries in, X, in Ecto. The difference in Ecto from Active Record for me, and we'll come back to this in a little bit later, is Active Record in a lot of ways does magic uh, with your queries. 
And so you don't know necessarily when it's going to, when it fires. You don't necessarily know how it's going to compose the sequel. Uh, it does a, a great job most of the time. And when it doesn't, it's really hard to understand. And um, Ecto is very clean, very direct, and there's no question what your query is going to translate into uh, in Ecto. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Elixir is built on Erlang, which is very robust, been around 25 years, uh, very solid uh, language used in the telecom industry. Uh, the immutability is standard. I mean, it's a functional language, and so you're, you're, you're not allowed to mutate state uh, in, in the Elixir code. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of reasoning about code. And it's very, very hard to reason about code when it's constantly mutating state as an object. I like object-oriented programming. Uh, I, I like the fact that I can create objects that have behavior and so forth. Uh, but sometimes, uh, especially when the code gets very complex, it's really hard to reason about it because you don't know what state it's in. And there's never any question in Elixir about the state of the code. It has a Ruby-like syntax, which I like. The, it is static code checking, so I don't have to write code to find out that the line of code that I just wrote it has a syntax error in and it isn't going to execute. That method doesn't exist. Yes, I know now that the method doesn't exist right away before I even deploy it into, God forbid, a production environment. Um, and the test environment is, I, I get away from testing syntax. I get, I get down and focused on testing the, the actual behavior of the application. And lastly, I'll say it, it's fast. I mean, hundreds of processes uh, supported on minimal hardware. And the, um, the first time that I saw a microsecond symbol on the uh, response uh, to a request, uh, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I mean, I, I've never, ever seen that in Rails. And, uh, and I see it regularly. In, the first time I ever did a microsecond symbol in Yeah. The, um, so basically, how did I, I do it? OK, so we're going to get started in the, uh, in the approach. Basically, I started from scratch. I didn't try to do any kind of conversion of the code that I had. I basically just rewrote the application from scratch. I did leverage the scaffolding capabilities that exist in Phoenix. Uh, we're going to talk about how long some of this talk, uh, took. I embraced the conventions that they had. Of course, they have a similar directory structure, similar approach to controllers and routing. Um, actually, a little bit simpler, if, if I can say that. They What they call what we call views in Rails are really a set of views, modules, and templates uh, in the in the Elixir uh, or in the um, Phoenix environment. So they're split up a little bit better, but I think in a very clean way. And then they have a, a tool called Mix, which takes the does most of what Rake and Bundle and those sorts of things that that we use. Um, to manage the definition of the application. Very similar to asset management. A nice that it uses Webpack. I really like that. Uh, it was my first experience with Webpack, and, and uh, I found it to be um, very nice to manage the assets that way. Uh, some differences. Uh, this concept of a chain set. The concept that you're basically going to put together a pipeline of things that you're going to validate, you're going to cast variables, you're going to create this set of alterations that you're going to make to your persistent storage, and then you're going to execute on that. The fact that you can do that in a very simple pipeline manner and so forth, um, I found to be 
very clean compared to having validations over here and having the you know casting over here and some of that being magic that active record active records going to do for you and and uh, and all of the what are there five six seven different ways you can update do an update command in in rails that is very very clean approach in phoenix and then of course the capability during request processing to have plugs uh, which is basically a, a way of just inserting small amounts of behavior and transitioning from the request to the response to that request. Very, very clean. Um, and obviously then those plugs become ways that you can add things like authentication and, and those sorts of things in a very, very clear manner. It's not just something that happens magically in the background. It's, you know when it's going to happen, you know it's going to happen after this and before the next thing. I thought I'd throw a, a slide in here that would help you understand some of the gems that I was dealing with in my Rails application, and those dependencies or depths that are, exist in the environment, in, uh, in, in, in the community for, of Phoenix and, and so forth. There are just a tremendous amount of equivalent, I'll say equivalent uh, with a little bit of an asterisk, but an equivalent functionality. Uh, so, uh, and, I, and I believe that this is continuing to sort of snowball uh, to where people are saying, hey, I want to do what this gem does in Rails. I want to do it in, in my Phoenix application. And, and somebody takes that and provides equivalent clean functionality. So if you just go right down the line, I'm not going to read through each one of these things, but basically I was able to find equivalent functionality that I could leverage without having to scrape together my own. So I, I found that to be very, very, uh, very, very um, enabling uh, for this transition. Because if I had to you know, take one of these important applications uh, that that I was using a gem for and try to reproduce that, I would have been really challenged to to even embark on on this. Where do I stand? Well, this is sort of a synopsis of of what I've invested in this process to date. And then, like I said, it was like March or April of this year that I started on this and I, this is sort of a side project uh, for me. It's an important project because I want to get it done and I've chosen that this is the direction that I'm going to take. I'm going to retire the Ruby on Rails side now that I've been able to see that this is coming to fruition. But I've probably invested 20 days so far and I've got almost the same functionality that I had in my Ruby and Rails application in 20 days of my time. Now I knew the application, so I wasn't like learning the application, but what I didn't know was, I didn't know Elixir, I didn't know Phoenix, and I didn't know Ecto. Now I've been a programmer for a long time, back when they called thing, people like me programmers. Okay, My first job was a junior programmer, so that's how far back I go. But uh, so learning things is, as we all know, it's expected as part of this industry. You've got to do that or you die, right? But um, just amazing amount of progress in what I'll call a relatively short period of time. And I can only see it continuing to, um, to go faster and faster as I get more of this muscle memory about how to do things in, in this new world. So just about done. Learnings. Object versus functional. Probably the biggest challenge that I had was learning a functional way of programming. I haven't done functional programming since I did Fortran and COBOL. So this is the, a new world. Now I did PHP just before they added classes in there so that I could do PHP. But most of my PHP application is not class-based. 
So I've, the, over the time that I've been working with, with Ruby, I've been doing solid object-oriented programming, and the functional programming is way different. Um, but I like it, especially in Elixir with the pattern matching, because a lot of what I would normally do with conditionals and I'll call it complex logic, ends up being relatively straightforward pattern matching using Elixir. And it took me a while to get pattern matching in Elixir. I'm not that smart. But the, the way that they've done pattern matching and the, and the different ways that you can use the pattern matching uh, are just extraordinary, extraordinary change in the way you construct the code. So that one's a hard one to get, but once you get it, it's really great. Foreground versus background processing. I said, you know, you probably remember that there's this complex architecture diagram that I showed up front, and how right now most of the application has been pushed into Ruby and Rails code for background processing. And the only thing I've got in PHP right now is this UI. That's where everybody sees, but that's where it is. In the way that Elixir handles hundreds of processes, thousands of processes, I'm probably going to dismantle the way that I have this control agent out there, this beanstalk, divvying out workload to various different Ruby on Rails processes. I'm going to just call the endpoints for various different functions just directly into the, the Phoenix API and let them process it. I mean, there's, they have capabilities for supervisors. They have the monitors. I can, uh, it'll, it'll be robust enough that if I need to retry things, I can retry it. But now everything can be done concurrently. And I have one platform. I don't have to worry about you know, making sure the queue is processing and things like that. I can just go off and get things done just like that. That's going to be a vast change when, when I get to that point. But I'm very excited about that. Obviously, things are very explicit in, in Phoenix and, and Ecto and in Elixir in general. It's very, very easy to see what's happening. And that's one of the challenges that I've always had with Rails in particular, not Ruby, but with the Rails in particular, there's there's enough magic happening behind the scenes that it's very hard to have a clear understanding of it. And as we go from Rails 4 to Rails 5 to Rails 6 and beyond, it's going to get more and more cloudy out there. And that doesn't seem to be the approach that the Phoenix and the Ecto developers are taking. The, the, the straightforwardness and the obviousness of what's happening uh, seems to be um, just as important as, the, as adding the functionality. My application has um, single table inheritance in it. And that is not well received by, by Phoenix or by Ecto, I should say. Um, it really it was a mistake on my part to, to really go as far as I went with single table inheritance. And, and I want to be clear, there are multiple different kinds of single table inheritance. I mean, we tend to lump that concept of single table inheritance together, but there's four or five different kinds of that. And I've done a couple of things in my application that are decent and some that are very poor and are now very obvious as well. So I'm going to have to deal with that somehow in, during this transition. I mentioned earlier the Hamel ERB thing versus EEX, which is the sort of the template equivalent in, in, the, uh, in the world of, of Phoenix. Um, just cannot believe how easy it is to take these EEX uh, files and compile them and and get them running and trust that I never things that I can never trust 
in ERBs or Haml, and that was that any code that I put in there was getting executed at some point, getting looked at at some point, getting syntax checked at some point, uh, and the testing environment in, in Rails does not make that easy for you to get to ensure that all of your views are thoroughly tested. Uh, that, that I think is a, a real weakness. And above and beyond performance, I can now trust that the code that's in my EEX uh, is, is actually part of the first partner to all of the rest of the code that I have. So I, I think that that is an vast improvement because that's a critical area. As I said earlier, much more useful error messaging. I mean, error messaging that's actionable. I mean, it does tell you what's wrong and it also helps guide you to what you should be doing. And lastly, it is a rapidly evolving infrastructure. Every time I pick the application back up and spend a few hours on it. This has been upgraded, that's been upgraded, they've added these features. So it's a very, very dynamic environment in, the, in, in that uh, Elixir community right now. And, uh, and, and I think it's a stupendous um, thing that's going on. Uh, so next steps, I need to get to the point where it's uh, equivalent functionality to my rail, the Rails UI that I had partially developed. I need to convert all those background functions that, that I've talked about. I want to retire the Ruby and the Rails uh, portion of that. And then I can retire the balance of that app that was the PHP piece because now I'll have a functioning and hopefully um, in, in this decade uh, a better UI for, for everyone to experience. Uh, so the last slide is just some of the resources that I was able to use to, uh, to bring myself up to speed on this. Maybe you know about these, but I'll be happy to share um, this slide or in, any of the other resources um, with the Hint team and they can put it out someplace if you need to, if you'd like to look at these. I would say Bar none, these are great resources. Obviously, there's some important names like Chris and is it Josie? Jose? Um, I want to pronounce his name properly. Um, there are some great resources, but, it, but every one of these resources, every one of these books or PDFs uh, is very, very helpful in getting you uh, started down this, especially this first one that's written specifically for those people who know Rails and want to do something crazy like I'm doing. Um, that's, it, it really is a very good resource for comparing the two and helping you understand how to make that uh, transition. So, questions? Who, who here, let, let me ask a question and get it started. Who here ha has done Elixir? Uh, okay, and who, who has looked at Elixir, looked at Phoenix, looked at Ecto, maybe hasn't done any of them, but okay, good. Do you have any questions about what, what these tools do that you'd like to ask me? And I think you have probably some of the, the largest amount of experience with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you, and, and I take it you've done Ruby and yeah. Rails in the past, and yeah. How how would you class uh, classify them? It's interesting what? to hear someone else's experience. Okay. Interesting. Um, I'd have to really think about a couple of things to say. Or, uh, I apologize for putting you on the spot. But. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't to think about that. My question um, was, uh, how big is this app? How many models, controllers that um, are you replacing? There are about uh, 70 models, okay? Uh, the, 
the, num the number of controllers is probably more like 30 or 40. There's an awful lot of this application that is, uh, it, that has to do with generating analytics. It basically takes, for instance, as I was mentioning, the, uh, the, the process that people go through is, is sort of what's called the Delphi method. I don't know whether you have familiarity with the Delphi method, but it's basically an iterative method that uh, basically we invite people into a seed interview. Um, we would invite, invite you in. We, here's the topic. We're going to talk about what we call the GUBA. You can laugh. That's, it's called the GUBA. And the GUBA is goals, unintended consequences, barriers, and assumptions. And so we basically talk on those four different elements of whatever topic it is that we're going to talk about, a strategy, a project, a, a business problem that you have. And we collect your opinion in what we call a seed interview. And then we take everybody's seed interviews and we put them in a pot. And the language analysis combined with some deduplication and things like that that happened sort of semi-automatically, along with some facilitated reduction, we end up with what we call an opinion survey. And the opinion survey is typically about somewhere between like 50 and 100 questions spread across these four different categories, goals, unintended barriers, and assumptions. And we basically ask you from strongly agree to strongly disagree, how do you feel about this statement? And each person fills out this survey, typically takes them about 15 or 20 minutes uh, to, to take the survey. And then we throw all of those results in a pot. And then we slice it and dice it in different ways. We try to understand where everybody has what we call shelling points. That's the name of the company. But it's, it's named after Thomas Schelling, uh, Nobel Prize winner for game theory in 2005. Um, it, it, it slices and dices these by whatever aspects we know about the, the group. So we might know it, that you know, we have, we're dealing with three different physical locations. We have some people who have been with the company over 10 years and some people who are brand new. We start to look at all of the results in these various different mechanisms. And about 20 or 25 of the models are related to, um, to basically different ways that we can look at, at that same data so that we can analyze that. Then we have a couple, well, five models that deal with what we call observations. So the reason that we have this application is because what we do is really hard to do. And so um, people get paid big consulting dollars to do this typically. And what we do is we provide these consultants with the platform to do it for them so that they could spend their time talking to their clients, solving their clients' problems, and sharing their domain knowledge instead of slicing and dicing analytics. So we have a, a set of modules that deal with what we call observations. And they basically look at all of this analysis that we have on the these dimensions, and they digest it, and they write a report. So the application is designed to around the possibility that it's going to spit out an analysis of your answers in a way that you can understand. So we're really taking the work away from having it be done based upon the quality of that consultant. The junior consultants get just as much benefit out of this as the senior consultants do. It, it's that kind of play um, in, the, in the world. But in terms of models, there's an awful lot of models that are involved behind the scenes in these background processes that have nothing at all to do with the UI. So that's why the number of controllers is far less than the number of models. Would you consider 20 days from not knowing anything to largely reproducing that? That's yeah. Amazing. <laughs> well, it is, but, it, but I have to give the credit to the tools. I mean, the tools are of the caliber 
that it can crank out a lot of code, you know, as, as Rails scaffolds can crank out a lot of code as well. But I can then turn around and crank out that code and then pare down what I don't need, take out what, what is, is not useful to me. I know the application though. So I'm not dealing with this from the, uh, you know, it's just a process that, that Instead of just embracing, well, this is how you do it. Yeah. There was a definitely a turning point when I'm like, okay, it's, it's totally not Rails. It's totally not yeah, Rails. it's not Rails. Stop thinking. About yeah, this don't, don't, that. yeah, don't. Yeah, don't. Yeah. Surface yeah. Surface it's surface. it's close enough that you can you can make the transition. You know, it's not like going to Cobol or something like that. Right. But it but it, it is. Like no, it's no, exactly. Uh, but it's but it is. It is what I want to do is is leave you with the impression that this is really doable, and it's really something that even if you don't choose to actually go all the way, it's an interesting experiment if you're really familiar with the application that you're working with, and you're really interested in like expanding your horizons about what's possible. You're, it's not a huge investment, even if you don't go all the way. I'm not suggesting that you need to. Uh, you know, abandon the existing Ruby and Rails. I, I love Ruby and Rails, but expand your horizon, and I think you'll be better for it. So, any other questions? All right, thank you. Appreciate it.